Well, hello, St. Mary's. It is, uh, so it's great to have everybody here and to be able to come and join us. Now, if you have been following um, St. Mary's preaching, so this past, uh, this past weekend, uh, it had to do with the theme of forgiveness. And during, uh, during my sermons, I mentioned uh, the story of a parishioner of ours who uh, had, a, had a, a, a pretty intense experience of forgiveness uh, that had to do with the murder of her sister and, uh, and kind of how all of that uh, uh, kind of fell into place uh, for her and for her family. And so, so I mentioned it as an illustration in my, in my sermon on Sunday, but I said that we would have an opportunity, uh, if she was willing, to be able to kind of go through and tell the story in, in a way that was just a little bit uh, more relaxed and you could see her, meet her, and, and have a little bit more time to go through some of the details. So I am very glad <laughs> to welcome my friend, uh, Carol Bates. Uh, if you're here at St. Mary's, uh, you may know her. She's a member of a life group, she and her husband, George. Um, she also oftentimes plays the piano at Mary's Kitchen, and she just kind of comes around. Uh, so it's uh, it's great to be able to sit down and have a have a a, a longer conversation with with you, Carol. So um, so we already kind of jumped into this what the topic is uh, for us. But so go back and tell me a little bit about about your sister and um, and where you grew up and kind of what it was like for you as, as you were growing up. What was your family like? Well, our parents were missionaries, career missionaries in uh, two third world countries, El Salvador first and Guatemala. Okay. From the time we were, there were four of us children in the family, uh, two brothers and a sister, and we all went to missionary children's school. So we were never at home for any schooling of any kind. But we grew up in a very safe environment where we were really taught to love the Lord and to accept him into our lives. Uh, we went to missionary children's school in Guatemala, uh, traveling from El Salvador. And oftentimes it was um, in a little prop plane that landed in a cornfield. <laughs> Other times it was a, a, a bus that had oh, no wow. really windows and so forth and so on. So we lived a, a very adventurous life. Wow. And so, um, and so, did your parents, uh, as, you, as you were growing up there, and then you, did you come back to the States? At what point did you come back to the States? In those days, it was every five years you came back to the States for kind of a renewal, uh, refreshment, and to load your barrels with clothing yeah. uh, for the children and any other supplies that you needed. Okay. And then as you got older, um, did you, uh, for college, or when did you come back to move back to the States? I came back to the States when I was 12 years old to go to high school. Okay. And I went to a private Christian school in Asheville, North Carolina. And 50% uh, of the student body were missionary kids from all over the world. So we were displaced third world culture kids, and we were all freaked out. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, yeah. we were not familiar with the culture to which we belonged. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so did your, so your sister, Helen, Helen, right? Yes. Um, did she, she went to the same school as your, all of your siblings did? She did, but she was, of course, uh, three years younger than I, so it was my senior year that she was a freshman, and my, okay. my older brother had already been graduated. Okay, all right. And so then, um, so then kind of, kind of fast forwarding. So you met the love of your life in George and got married and moved where? Uh, we met at Moody Bible Institute. We were both there as students and we lived in Decatur, Illinois uh, after graduation for, for both of us. Well, yes, we both, see in those days, uh, Moody was only a three year diploma school. So we went on to college. I went to the University of Illinois. He went to Millican University in Decatur, a Presbyterian school, and I transferred there, got my degree, and then went on to grad school. Okay, and uh, and so did you, did you, were, so you and Helen, um, would you say you were fairly close as you were growing up and, and kind of got married and, and, uh, and kind of got on with the rest of your life? Were you, were you in touch with each other? I, I couldn't hear your question because it froze. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Yes. Oh no! Um, were you were you close um, to each other? 
uh, as sisters? As sisters. Uh, probably during that era of my life, I was not because my sister, of course, was still, you know, in, in grade school, hadn't come to high school. When she came to high school, finished there, she went on to North Texas State University and got her teaching degree. And uh, she would come up and visit us when I was, you know, newlywed and uh, had children. Mm -hmm. But she didn't marry until she was 31 years of age. Oh, okay. So older. So, older. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so tell me about that. So she met Bill and, met, uh, and, mm -hmm. and they got married. So what was, what was that like? Was your family nervous, skeptical, enthusiastic? Well, I would say that my parents uh, were not skeptical to begin with until they found out that he was divorced. And of course, there was this whole stigma of divorce in the family and, oh, that's not right. And then they found out that he had a little boy mm -hmm. and Helen had uh, helped father or parent that child. Okay. And uh, sadly, uh, Bill had that child in, in 1970. Uh, his wife happened to be um, uh, in love with another woman. And so uh, in those days, the child was given to the father sure. in, a, in the divorce settlement. And so he met her at school. They were both school teachers in Skyline School in Dallas, Texas. And uh, they fell in love and were married in a private family wedding. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. And so then, um, you know, did your family, so did you just kind of, um, did you, uh, were you able to kind of wrap your arms around? Uh, around Absolutely. Bill? Absolutely. Yeah. We loved him. He was great for Jennifer, for Helen. And we, uh, had many occasions where they would come up and visit us in Illinois. Uh, you know, he liked to see snow and there wasn't much of it in Dallas. So, uh -huh. and my sister was not familiar with snow very much either. Yeah. So yeah. it was a very joyous occasion for us as we developed our friendship. Huh. And so tell me about Bill, what was he like? Bill, uh, I only knew him since he had become a Christian. Uh -huh. uh, what I did find out after they were married is that he had been married four times. Wow. And uh, he had served in the army, had come home from the army, uh, found his high school sweetheart, whom he had married, in bed with his best friend. Oh. That ended that marriage. Then he, on a rebound, married <clears throat> a college friend, and she left him after a few months. So then he um, married a gal that he had met when he was studying for his master's degree uh, and he married her and they were married for about five years mm -hmm. and then they just decided they weren't good for each other and here he was uh you know single again yeah. and he ran into a former student of his uh and married her and whoops they had a child wow. and then she disappeared she from his life wow so that's a lot of that's a, a that's so he was 38 years old uh wow. father todd he was 38 years old with one child wow and uh he didn't know the lord yeah. not at all never went to church yeah but a neighbor invited him to church and that's where he heard a message on romans 8 1 there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and so that's when he was converted uh, he knelt down by his by his bedside when he put Billy, his child, to bed, uh, and knelt and invited Christ into his life, and he changed completely. Wow! And so, what did that look like? Well, I only knew him since he was a believer, right? But his family saw a great difference in him right. because he now had focus and purpose in life, hmm. and uh, they just thought it was all because of Helen but it wasn't, it was because of Jesus Christ. Wow, and so um, so he became involved with, where did he and Helen meet? He and Helen met at this uh, Skyline School in Dallas, Texas. She okay. was teaching and he was teaching. And okay. he was then a Texas State bicycling champion. So oh. oftentimes a little Billy would sit on the back of his bicycle and feed him whatever he needed as he was oh. racing in preparation for the real races. Wow. And, and she would go when she met him and uh, participate in all of those events. Wow. So they were married for how long? 
29 years. 29 years, that's a long time. And, uh, and what would you say, how would you characterize you kind of their relationship? What did, what, did it, what did it look like? I believe that from what my sister would tell me, uh, and we were quite close, uh, it was a very good relationship. They were happy together. But when the ch their children, Billy, you know, the one that was Bill's, and they had a, a daughter shortly after they were married, uh, Evelyn, when the children left home and went to college, uh, it seemed like there was a little bit of drifting apart. My sister was very much into computer work, and she was doing a genealogy study of our family mm -hmm. and of Bill's family. Mm -hmm. And quite often when he would come home from work, he wanted her to sit in the living room with him and uh, watch sports. And she wasn't too much into that. So she would stay back and she, I've got to do a little bit more on my computer. So they kind of fell apart a little bit, okay. but not anything where I would say, it, you know, red flags to us as a family. Yeah, sure. And so then, um, so was, was, was faith an important part of their family? I mean, how Very did much they, so. the church, what did they, Very much so. what did they do? They went to Schofield Memorial Church. Both of them sang in the choir. At one point, Bill was asked to become a deacon in the church, and he shared his testimony, which he did not like to do because it was before Christ and it was pretty raunchy. Yeah. You know, and so, but he did, uh, he did become a deacon and was a quite a leader. He was also a falconer, and okay. so he did a lot of. Uh, um, speeches in the high schools and to various groups on falconry. Okay. All right. So quite a guy. I mean, competitive yes. bicycler, falconer, a teacher, involved leader in his church. Yes. So then, um, so take us up to um, the day when, uh, when you heard that your sister had been killed. What was that, what was that day like? Well, I was planning a surprise 60th birthday party for her and a surprise 70th for Bill because there was 10 years difference and it was within a month of each other of each other so we had planned a sit down dinner in Dallas and my husband had a secretary in his office who was doing most of the legwork on that mm -hmm. and uh, I came home one Saturday from having been involved in in events I was practicing a piano organ duets with the, the gal where I played the organ at church and I came home and there was a light blinking on my answering machine and it was from Becky Craig. Well, I knew them. Becky Craig was the Sunday school teacher's wife, the, the adult class that they attended. And I thought, oh, she's got something up her sleeve for the birthday dinner because she had already responded that they were coming. And that call shattered my life because I answered it. And Becky said, Carol, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but she said, Helen is with the Lord. And I'm going, what? Uh, she hasn't been sick. What happened? I just talked to her a couple of days ago. And then she told me, well, Bill came home from a race and found her dead on the floor of the office. I said, oh, I can't believe that. But that's, I mean, as silly as it is to say it now, I felt good that she hadn't died of a natural cause. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it just shows you shock does something shock, to right. you. Right. But immediately, my husband was out feeding horses. He has a serious horse addiction, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was out feeding the horses and he came in and we were going to dinner with another couple and he said, what's the matter with you? And I said, Helen's dead. And I was crying. Yeah. His mouth fell open. And I, he said, have you talked to Bill? I said, no, I called, but he's, so the police are interviewing him. And he said, well, he would be a natural suspect being the husband. And so he said, I better talk to him about getting an attorney. So uh, we called Becky back and Becky said, uh, he's, he's free now, so you can talk to him. So uh, yeah. that's when I talked, my wow. husband talked to him and told him he would be a suspect. So then what was it like um, in the days and weeks after, uh, after the horrific news? You know, what did, what did you and, a fam and your family do? Well, how did you respond to Bill? And what was your attitude towards him? Well, 
we we absolutely you know knew that they had they had, their house had been broken into before and jewelry had been stolen so that's what it looked like this happened but what we didn't know is that the chief of police of Saxe, Texas, which is a, a, a suburb of Dallas, he went in and he knew right away that it was a spousal homicide because the things that should have been taken by a thief, a robber, uh, they were still there. Her purse, money, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And for me, because of my relationship with the Lord, uh, you know, I had learned long ago as a child when I couldn't get in touch with my parents uh, because they didn't have telephones, you know, in the jungle mm -hmm. village where they lived, uh, the Lord was my best friend. And so my consolation had come from the word of God. I was reading in Deuteronomy at the time and they were going out on a fight somewhere and, and, and the scripture says, you know, I will go with you, I will be with you, I will go before you, I will go after you, blah, blah, blah. And I took consolation in that. but you know, the practicality of it was, is that two weeks after her death, three weeks after her death, it happened to be a Saturday before Easter Sunday and I was scheduled to play. Oh, wow. We get a phone call from the chief of police in Saxe saying that Bill had been arrested for the murder of Helen. And we're going, impossible. We know Bill, hmm. he's an upstanding person a wonderful man in the community. And so uh, the stories that we were hearing were vastly different from each member of the family. And so um, we decided we were gonna make a statement that George and I were going to abide by, that we were going to presume him innocent until proven guilty. And that was our stance. Okay. And we continued to love him, and to help him, of course, I flew right down to their house because we needed to sell his home in order to uh, pay for his defense, which at that time, the day that we called, that he called his attorney, his attorney said $50,000 to defend him. And by the time I got there one week later, it was up to $95,000. Wow, 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 wow. I'm seeing George. Hi, George. Hi, how are you? Camera. I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, Trying to keep my nose above the bubbles. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> so we're just having a conversation, uh, having a conversation about this important time during uh, during Carol's life and your family. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to stop in and say hi. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All good right. to see you. You take care. Um. And so then, um, so the the family kind of rallied around Bill, but now all of a sudden you know, these, uh, these, these questions for you. When did you, when did you, in your mind, become convinced that, uh, that Bill was guilty? It was not until the, the trial, which was in September of that year. She died on March, in March of 2004, and in September of 2004, we went to trial. Okay. And I still believed that he was innocent. I had some questions because of things that I had, um, had had little doubts about, but I still uh, was abiding by the, 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 what George and I had said, we were going to presume him innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. And every time that I visited him in jail while he was awaiting trial, I said to him, Bill, I don't care. He, he told me, he said, my defense attorney is telling me I can't talk about it to anybody. I said, Bill, I don't care what your defense attorney tells you. If I were innocent, I'd shout it from the rooftops. So I said, I don't understand that. And he said, well, you've not been trained for the military either, Carol. And that, you know, when they tell you, you don't divulge any information. It doesn't make any difference on the penalty of your life. That's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had to rest in the fact that, that God was in control of this situation and that I had to trust him until I knew. I wanted to know who the murder of my sister was. Yeah, yeah. So we went to trial in September of that year. Mm -hmm. And George and I were character witnesses on his behalf as well as the children. And I think there were probably 28 people. I was looking at the... Uh, uh, 
you know, court records, and I think there were 28 who mm -hmm. testified to his wonderful personhood and character and integrity, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't know is that there would be a gal who, after he retired from school teaching, he went to work for uh, a, a, an architectural firm that constructed railings and designed them and he was a draftsman and there was a young woman uh 20 years younger than he that came to work and thought he was pretty nice and had money and uh, they struck up a friendship and because of this little bit of um distancing that probably was present that my sister probably never even knew about between the two of them because she was doing her computer and he was watching sports it was appealing to him yeah. and you know when the lord when when the devil can't destroy your soul he's going to destroy your life yeah. and he put his big toe in the door and uh wrecked bill's life yeah had an affair yeah and so then so then so then he thought that it would be better to murder her than to get another divorce? Well, that's an interesting thing because many of my friends ask me the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and to you and to me, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But in his mind, he had been divorced four times. Yeah. And he's going, I'll never divorce another person. And yeah. of course, he was never going to marry again unless he found a woman who would love his child yeah. as if it were her own. And that was Helen. Yeah. So then, um, so then, when you when you found out, how did you? How, what abs, What convinced you that he was guilty? Well, I knew because I had gone to the Texas Rangers in Dallas, and I knew that they told me that there was a tape that had been um, uh, that they had that where he confessed that he had done it. And I said, well, I would like to hear that tape because I know his voice and I, I would recognize it. And so uh, I fully expected that that tape would show up and I would get to hear it before the trial. But nobody bothered to let me hear that tape or any of us hear the tape. And uh, they said it was a garbled tape and it would be difficult to hear the voice. I said, I don't care. I would like to hear it anyway. But it didn't happen. And so at the trial, because we were uh, witnesses on his behalf, we couldn't be in the courtroom. Now, my son is an attorney. He got permission from the judge to sit in the courtroom with his laptop so he could take notes, but under the condition that he was not to speak to us about it, which he did not. And it turned out that I was to be the last character witness before the trial ended. And uh, all my son told me, he said, Mom, uh, they'll probably give you a transcript of, you know, the, uh, uh, of this tape. And don't bother reading the transcript. Look at Uncle Bill. You will be able to tell by his demeanor whether or not he did it. Mm -hmm. And I was grateful for that because I probably would have read ahead instead of listening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I instead I watched Bill and his head just hung in shame. Hmm. And the tape was uh, the work of the Saxe Police Department who found out that Carla, his little lover, uh, had come to them and said, I had an affair with Mr. O'Neill. And they said, we'd like to wiretap your phone and put a wire on you so that you can um, extract information from him. Mm -hmm. And that was a tape where they had gone to dinner after the funeral and Bill had said, she asked, well, I think she wondered if he had done it because she saw it in the Dallas Morning News, not mm -hmm. from him. And uh, see, my sister was a teacher and it was spring break time. So, you know, um, so she said, something you said at dinner tonight made me wonder, 
did you do that for us, Bill? Because if it did, it wouldn't bother me at all. It makes me feel like, oh, you really care for me. Oh my God. Wow. And I'm going, what a dumb statement. No woman wow. in her right mind would say something like that. But of course, Bill wasn't in his right mind either. And so he spilled the beans and said, and the wonderful thing about it is, is that God forgives. I mean, he's witnessing to the woman <laughs> after doing what he did. Excuse me. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. 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 that's how I found out. That's how you found out. That's so, how I found out. And so then, um, and so what was, what was your, what was kind of rushing through you? What was your emotional reaction once you knew um, what happened inside of you? Father Todd, I left that courtroom when I heard that tape and the prosecuting attorney said to me, now, Mrs. Bates, do you have a different opinion of your brother-in-law, Bill O'Neill? I had never been in a courtroom like this. I'd, I hadn't, you know, and to be a witness, I said, I haven't been privy to all the information that you have given or all the, you know, uh, things that you have presented in your case. But I said, it sounds to me like only God Almighty and Bill O'Neill know who murdered my sister. And that was basically saying, Bill did it. And I left that courtroom and I just, I, I felt like I was going to throw up. Yeah. I just sank to the floor and my husband had gotten permission after he testified to come in and be moral support for me. Mm -hmm. And he picked, you know, he kept me from falling down. The two children who were both young marrieds were out still, you know, they couldn't be in the courtroom. Uh, they had already witnessed and they saw my demeanor and they knew their, da their dad had done it. And I mean, it was awful. Yeah. So the sentencing was to be the next day. And here's the other thing that was so wonderful because the place where I was reading then in my Bible was Job. And Job in Job 30 or 31 says that he made a pact with his eyes not to look upon a woman with lust because God Almighty brings great judgment. It was the story of our family. Yeah. And I knew that night that I was going to give a victim Im impact statement the next morning. It was a fairly sleepless night for me because I was trying to organize everything that I had been blown away by. And uh, I rushed to the courthouse the next morning and I talked to the, to the defense attorney, who, by the way, his name was Brian Blessing. He was anything but a blessing. Because I found out that the first time he talked to Bill, Bill told him, I did it. And instead of taking him before a judge, he who had such a good reputation, he probably would have only gotten 30 years, you know, and served half of it and been free now. But he saw, he said, I think I can get you off in reasonable doubt. Well, he bankrupt him and et cetera. But anyway, I was reading in the Bible in Job and I read that and I said, Brian, Bill has never spoken during this court uh, you know, appearance. I said, he's never said a word because you've told him not to. But I said, he needs to get up there and it needs to come from his own mouth. Hmm. So I said, you tell him that he needs to get on the stand. Oh, he said he won't do it. He's too scared. I said, I don't care whether he's scared or not. If he wants his family to heal, he needs to get on the stand. And so he came back 10 minutes later and he said, he'll do it. Hmm. And he did. And I got up then after the children, I told the children they didn't need to give statements, but they said, if you're going to give a statement, we will too, Aunt Carol. So they got up, each of them gave very emotional statements. They lost their mother and their father yeah. at that trial, basically. And when I got up there, I looked at my brother-in-law and I said, Bill, I've never planned a murder. I've never robbed a bank. I've done a lot of things that are wrong. And in God's sight, my sin nailed Jesus to the cross as much as what you did. And only because I have walked with God for over 50 years, can I say to you that I forgive you for murdering my sister. And I will pray for you. I will love you. I will encourage you. I will be your advocate. And I will see you in heaven someday. Because wow. I knew that he had asked God to forgive him. Wow. wow. 
the judge came down from the his and he shook my hand and he said you are a remarkable woman and i was so emotionally i could i couldn't say to him what i should have said which was sir that was not me who forgave my brother that was a moment that was a miracle from god wow. and i know it was father Todd. wow i know it was wow so and was the rest of your family were they in the same position as you uh, they were in the same position of hearing everything but i think there were numerous family members that probably thought i was a little speedy and forgetting yeah. <laughs> but you know i mean this is the thing i love so much about many things at saint mary's but the lord's prayer mm. you pray the lord's prayer it says in there you better forgive yeah because otherwise the father doesn't forgive you and look at what he's forgiven us from yeah. what mercy what grace yeah. what love so so how did you how did you continue from that time on how did how did that impact your life how did you in terms of your relationship with bill and your relationship with your rest of your family how did that how did how did you walk that out well he was sentenced to life without parole. So we knew that he would die in prison. And I had to sell their house. I had to go through everything in their house. Their children did not have enough strength to do that as young. So like, I can ask you, so why did you do that? He killed your sister. Why did you do that? <laughs> well, first of all, probably practically, I would say my sister and, and I were the only ones who had the stuff, the few things that my parents had after they had yeah. died. Okay. And so I knew that I would never get them out of that house if I didn't take them, right? <laughs> okay. So that's the practical part. The other part was that uh, I guess I have somewhat of a compassionate heart in that way, that this is someone that I had had 30 years to love, hmm. not as a husband, not as a child, but as a fellow believer. and. There was nobody who was going to do it for him yeah. and we needed the money yeah. to to pay for his defense because that lousy lousy defense i mean a, a prosecuting a lot defense attorney, defense attorney right. had had absolutely taken all of his credit cards and gotten all the cash advance so that it, there was great debt yeah. and i was the one to do it yeah so then so you so you um, incredibly kind of helped to unwind his estate and then so then um uh, and for your family how did how did pieces come back together for them well i think that probably they all realize that for me to have liberation freedom uh, no hatred i mean the court reporter herself wrote me a lovely note and said in 30 years that she had been a court reporter she had never seen this happen in the court it's usually go to hell i don't want to talk to you again and blah 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 right. Right. and so she said it was a wonderful testimonial and she happened to be a christian woman and but for me uh i i i journal a lot so i journaled cobs i mean prayers daily stuff and and a lot of reading and one of the books that i read is this one when god interrupts oh, okay and it's uh i don't even know if it's in print now but it was by somebody by the name of barnes i read that george read it uh we sent out a letter with you know to our, many of our friends and told them that uh this was a difficult adjustment for us but oh. uh you know and we would see where god i mean because god does things for his glory mm -hmm. and we don't always understand it yeah. Yeah. and so <laughs> good things have come as a result of this really so tell me so what good things have come uh, since that time well the first thing that happened is i wanted to use the uh, monies that people gave us in illinois from you know our church there uh because Bill was from Dallas and, and, you know, he had different ideas on what he wanted to do. This is before people knew that, you know, he had committed the murder. <laughs> and so I, all of the memorials in, in my town 
city of from, your, from your church, from your from your, my family. church and my acquaintances and my clubs and so forth. Uh, I used it to build a playground in uh, my sister's name hmm. in the country of our birth. And I took a trip down to Guatemala to look at land and uh, became acquainted with the former first lady of Guatemala who happened to be a believer. Hmm. And uh, it was a wonderful thing because she told me that the lady who led her to Christ, who was in the room with us when I met her, uh, she has 400 volunteers teaching the Bible in public schools oh, in wow. Guatemala. Wow. And because their constitution says they have, must teach morality and they do it through the Bible. And so uh, George and I uh, decided to finance giving each one of those teachers a set of flannel graph lessons on the life of Christ, mm -hmm. because that's the precursor to video. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they yep. didn't have all that. Yep. And, and so we supplied that. And then on uh, the patriarchs, uh, when that was published, and then those were published by kids around the world, which is was started in Rockford to build uh, playgrounds in third world countries. And it's a wonderful thing if people want to Google that and mm -hmm. see the things that they do. They, they, they've built over 500 playgrounds in many third world countries in mm -hmm. North Korea, several mm -hmm. playgrounds there. But in any event, so that's that was one thing that I did. And And then in the village where I grew up, they didn't need a playground, they needed a school. And so we have a school there that we helped enhance and uh, fix up. And we put in the first computer lab, but they didn't have the internet. Okay. Well, just a year ago, yesterday, we went to that very school and delivered 50 Chrome tablets so that every student in that school has a chance to be on computer. That's and the internet came about two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're using what's a Rachel device, which houses the internet. You can hang it on a nail on a tree or anywhere, and it goes out like 50 meters. So all of those children now are, uh, you can get the whole curriculum that you need in the uh, Guatemalan school system. Wow. And they can be learning all of that on computer. And so first through sixth grade in this school hmm. are on those computers. Wow. Yeah. And so that's all in, in memory of your sister. My, it, my sister and my mother and father and now my deceased brother, Henry, who translated the track that I think you have that Bill wrote. Oh, yeah, sure. And right. uh, which can be duplicated if anybody wants it. You can run it off on a machine, but he translated it into Spanish, so we've used it in Spanish, and it's been translated also in Urdu okay. at one time when I was going to go to Pakistan to speak on yeah. forgiveness, yeah. but yeah. the political situation kept me from it. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me about forgiveness. So it seems like forgiveness for Bill came pretty quickly, I mean remarkably quickly. So yeah. has that been, has that been Kind of your experience through your life is that forgiveness for somebody who hurts you comes pretty quickly i think you're preaching <laughs> <laughs> i'm just asking the question well you know my husband would tell you he's not in the room thank the lord <laughs> uh he says that i have difficulty forgiving people i don't know if that's exactly correct uh i have a great deal of trouble forgetting what they've done that has hurt me. Yeah. I don't spend a lot of time or waste a lot of time in thinking of how I can get even, but it bothers me when someone has hurt me deeply and they can't say sorry. Yeah. And so I think that probably the Lord is still doing a lot of things in my life to, so that I I, I know that what I did with Bill was not of myself. It was definitely a miracle. And I just pray that as I deal with people who are kind of naughty <laughs> mm -hmm. and hurt me, uh, that I can say, you know what? Uh, God has blessed me so much. Not going to waste the time, but, you know, um, continue friendships or whatever. Yeah. So it's hard. So, so his, uh, so Bill's attorney, have you forgiven him? 
You know what? Um, in reading the te the uh, court reports, uh, it's been a long time since I've read them, and I think I was too emotionally spent yeah. to concentrate on them. Yeah. Uh, I think I need to write him a letter and tell him, because I tried to get him disbarred. I have a very good friend who was a missionary kid of mine who's a, a, an administrative judge in Washington, D.C. And I called Rollin and I said, Rollin, I said, this guy, he was lousy. I don't know what to do about it. And he said, Carol, you'll spend a fortune. No. You know, so I think I need to write him a letter. I think I will be honest and tell him how much disrespect I have for what he did since Bill told him the truth the first time he went to him. Yeah. And and I just, uh, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of attorneys that um, maybe use it. I mean, he helped himself to my sister's car, and there's yeah. nothing we could do about it. Right. Uh, and, you know, all this money. But anyway, so I think I need to write him a letter and a few other people, too. But I, I was very truthful with uh, Keith Hyde, the uh, young uh, prosecuting attorney, because when he didn't come with the tape when I could have heard it. I went to him and I said, I'm gonna to talk to you like your mom. Because <laughs> I said, I know you're a good attorney the way you have done this and even in the time that he spent with me. But I said, I don't appreciate the fact that you never expended one ounce toward letting me hear that tape beforehand. We wouldn't have had this trial. No. We wouldn't have had it. Yeah. And to drag a family through that is just sheer nonsense, awful. Yeah. So do you, as you look back at it all, do you, uh, do you feel like you carry this um, no. still with you? Or do you feel no. like you've been able to kind of to offload it and give it to God? Totally liberated, Father Todd. Totally. Mm -hmm. I do not, I do not, I, I, I never volunteered to be the victim of a crime. Mm -hmm. But you know what? God has used this to help so many children in Central America that would not have heard the gospel of Christ mm -hmm. because I wouldn't have done this. I would have gone back as a tourist and, and seen the people that I know and love. But God has used it for good, just like in Joseph's life. Mm -hmm. You know, it was meant for evil by his brothers, but God meant it for, for the greater good. Well, Carol, that's a remarkable story. I really appreciate your willingness to, uh, to, to kind of share it um, uh, with us, it's it's not easy to to kind of go back and and recall things that have been painful. But and I think too, as you said, we I mean we live in a world of injustice where mm -hmm. people do things that are bad and harmful, and usually, hopefully, unintentionally, but sometimes very intentionally. And so then, how we can how we can pursue justice and do the things that need to be done, but also. Um, knowing that we have, you know, we have a Lord who commanded us, he commanded us that's to right. love and commanded us to forgive. And that's, so that becomes a, an important part of our spiritual life. So thank you for your willingness to, uh, to, uh, to share your story with us and, and, uh, and be sure to thank George for, for just kind of his little uh, cameo as he came <laughs> in and shared a, shared a minute with us. So thank, thank you. you. He forgot that I was in here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to get back to his desk. Well, can I say a final closing prayer? Absolutely. So, Lord God, we give you thanks um, that you are always with us and that you love us and care for us. And, and we just uh, recognize with you that, uh, that the world is broken and our lives are broken. And, uh, and yet you don't leave us in our brokenness, but you come to us to provide healing and strength. And uh, and invite us to uh, to unhook ourselves from from the the kind of of uh, desire for revenge or our our kind of our, uh, holding holding uh, grudges holding our way, Lord God, and not letting you take them and free us up and receiving your goodness and your grace. So so thank you for Carol uh, for her willingness to share and be with us as a community of people that we would be people of grace and of mercy, uh, filled by your spirit, doing your work. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.